From all of us at United Stations and at Kai FM, it's absolutely splendid to see you all here this morning. I think we couldn't have chosen a better day to spend in, indoors, <laughs> and uh, we hope we can really make it uh, worth your while today. I'm Riley Bunce uh, from the United Stations. Um, it's been our pleasure to walk the last couple of years alongside Kaya. It's been a very, very exciting time. And um, we're looking very forward uh, to this morning. My job is going to be to usher the speakers on as quickly as possible, introduce them to you, and keep the, keep the day flowing. Today you're going to hear more about the most amazing societal shift that has happened anywhere in the world. Given the shift, brands can no longer make guesses and assumptions about their target audience or carry on simply doing what they've always done. Entrepreneurs and marketing execs are alert to the importance of the anthropolitan consumer and their growing purchasing power. It's a market that has a hunger for consumption, but it prefers brands that speak its idiom and embrace its cultural <coughs> heritage. Um, anthropolitans don't just simply arise and then uh, disappear into the middle class melting pot. They have an authentic identity, and the best way to reach them is not through a general market approach. Although the black middle class already exceeds the size and buying power of white counterpart, many of the marketers that we interact with are still cautious in their tactics. But even the most cautious of those are beginning to realize that if they don't act now, they may never get a second chance. The business case for investing in the metropolitan consumer is no longer a mystery, and that is one of the reasons for the seminar today. Afropolitans are basically growing tired of being the target of new marketing campaigns by brands that are not creating cultural connectivity. In fact, they are more likely to turn away from those brands that they see as only interested in selling to them, and are more inclined to build trustworthy relationships with brands that take the time to understand who they are and what they represent. Unfortunately, there are many brand owners who have given up on the Afropolitan market when they don't get an absolutely immediate return on their investment. This is especially true with companies that face massive pressure to perform. And I think there's probably nobody in this room that isn't feeling that pressure right now. These marketers continue to look for shortcuts. Forgetting that converting Afropolitans into loyal buyers is a marathon and not a sprint. So attention points mount and opportunity can go begging. Today you'll hear successful marketers advise that the Afropolitan market can no longer be viewed as a short-term expense, but should rather be approached as a strategic, long-term investment. Remarkably, very few brands have defined and consistently supported a strong enough narrative that speaks specifically to Afropolitans. For now, brand marketers still have a lack of confidence in the Afropolitan market that is in direct proportion to their lack of knowledge. Capturing this trend-setting and game-changing audience takes a different approach, and it's one that the industry is just waking up. The brands that are, that are making a serious commitment to the Afropolitan market have already realized that more success will come to those who support specific business models that target them. Afropolitans want you to earn the right to become a member of the family. This is how you build ultimate trust with them. We're hoping that today we can provide you with some insights um, that will assist you going forward. Attitude is that if you walk out there with two or three things that really impact your business uh, going forward, we think the morning uh, would definitely be worthwhile. First up this morning is Greg Maloka. He's our fearless leader at uh, Kaya FM. He's not only really the MD of uh, the station, but um, he kind of sees himself as the guy that goes out up front through the forest climbs the highest tree, looks out, and kind of sees what's happening in the landscape, and he brings it back, and he's extremely good at it. Um, he's also somebody who absolutely loves radio. I think he started his first radio station in primary school, from the bedroom <laughs> in, in Deep Cliff. And knowing his capabilities, I'm sure it was quite a hit in that block around, around his, his office. But, um, He's, he's got a long and um, illustrious career in, in radio. It's pretty much what he's done ever since, ever since then. Uh, many of you will know that he's one of the founders of also of YFM. Uh, he tells a fantastic story, um, which I don't have time to talk to today, but to cut it short, he joined the queue, like many, many other people, to try and get onto the new station that was about to be birthed, and spent half a day in the queue, 
and managed to interacting with various people, work himself forward to the front of the queue, into the office, and by the end of the day was interviewing other people <laughs> coming through the door. That's, that's kind of great. But he is a metropolitan, and um, in this first piece, uh, he's going to really talk a little bit about being a metropolitan, uh, pretty much from the heart. Thanks, Greg. Two things run out onto a flooding pitch. The crowd erupts into a roar, and the nerves begin to flutter. The referee raises his arms, and it's go time. The pitch is the same in measurement for both teams. Since the same number of people in both their grounds, and maybe even an equal number of home and away supporters. But there is, for the home team, a sense of familiarity. The knowledge of how the tune forms in the evenings, where the wind will slow from the sun's day. A few subtle things that may make a difference between winning and losing. It is the home advantage. Kai FM talks about the Afropolitan, but who is this Afropolitan? In simple terms, the Afropolitan is as different and as familiar as you are. A superficial look at the background of these Afropolitans will lead you to thinking that this is a complex consumer class, difficult to understand, and perhaps even intimidating. Nothing could be less accurate and further from the truth. The Afropolitan has been around for decades. It represents people who are gender, well-educated, socially aware, and family-oriented. This is not a sudden emergence of a new class. However, Afropolitans existed in the times of Sophia Town, in the 50s, they existed during the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. It's a class of people who were there before independence, who will be there for a long time to come. The early Afropolitan was self-motivated, successful individual, despite considerable wealth. Innovators, leaders, powerhouses. These were men and women that built a thriving middle class and upper middle class in the shadows of a society. And how brands and advertisers can position their messages within this valuable consumer class. The insight on these subtle differences is where we find the difference between good and great, or winning and losing. There's never been a better time to ask the 400 billion man question. Good morning. Good morning. Are you guys good? Yes. I, I like a little bit of drama. So. <laughs> I did ask them to play that thing loud and wind up speakers, line up speakers everywhere, but. Uh, nobody listens to me anymore, so it's okay. I hope I hope you listen to me. Um, we've been uh, on this trail um, about the Afropolitan. By the way, we just came back from uh, Cape Town. Um, and how are you? Um, we're, we're in Cape Town. Got anyone from Cape Town? It's okay, don't be shy. <laughs> okay, this is interesting. There's one black person from Cape Town. <laughs> um, guys, Cape Town is another country for real. I'm sorry. I, you know, I was never one of those people who um, uh, promote, you know, the, uh, the country called Cape Town and another country called South Africa. Uh, pr promote that idea. I was I was never part of those people, but more and more I go. I just you know whenever you go to a place and people look at you and think you must be special, <laughs> you must be different. Um, we don't see your kind here anyway. <laughs> you all just show up when the jazz is happening <laughs> and um, and the polo, you know. But and then you fly off to New York somewhere. Uh, the truth is we are from Johannesburg, uh, and we are from politics, we are from this country. Um, a lot of people, uh, and I suppose what's special about Johannesburg is that um, we, we get to see each other more often. I suppose, you know, when, when, um, when certain things happen in your life only at work, and they are not reinforced in your you know, everyday life, it becomes difficult to believe. Um, but when they get reinforced in you know, your other spaces, 
you tend to realize what they are. What I'm hoping to achieve um, in the next 25 minutes or so um, is to address the gaps in the market. So to really talk about the effects of um, you know, those gaps, what it means to, to have gaps, what it means to um, deal with an audience that was ignored for a long time. That's really what it is. Okay. Um, would you say that it is true um, that all our actions today are informed by our experiences before? Would that be right? So our behavior is generally um, informed or influenced by where we've been and what our experiences are so forth. So meaning, um, if there's a girl in uh, Zondi, I'll pick on Zondi because we always pick on Zondi. <laughs> uh, if there's a girl in Zondi, uh, in Soweto, um, who's um, never been outside of Zondi, um, and there's Julianne in Four Ways, who's never been outside of, well, I suppose she has been outside of Four Ways, but never really ventured into um, Soweto, and each of them get an invitation for a birthday party. So um, a girl from Zondi gets an invitation to Santa or to Foyce for a birthday party. She will have sets of questions, would you think? Um, um, where is it? Um, how do I get there? What do I wear? It's a good thing we're in 2014 that I was the other question would be, will they let me in? <laughs> Um, but, you know, she'll have questions. Similarly, um, my girl from Foyce will have the same questions. If she got told there's a birthday party in Zondi, um, she will have the same questions. What do I wear? What do I speak? Will they understand anything I say? Um, somebody got to touch my head. <laughs> and trust me, there will be somebody who's got to touch my head. <laughs> That might just be me. <laughs> um, but, but the point is, um, when, when people are isolated, when people are kept in spaces, irrespective of their economic conditions or whatever other conditions, hey, what's that? It's not nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry. Um, people will have questions. You know? that's, that's just generally what it is. And I think sometimes we, we tend to think about the apropolitan um, as the special species that needs to be put in, you know, uh, in a lab and dissected, and you just want to study what they are, how they think. You know? um, one of the questions that made Peter very happy in Cape Town was, <laughs> "How do they make financial decisions?" <laughs> just like everyone else. <laughs> you know, um, what's beautiful about this country uh, is that we are having a conversation, and this is the one thing that I would like all of us to embrace. The fact that we are talking about stuff is important. The fact that we're talking about uh, electricity and how we think this coal story is not the right story. Um, <laughs> it's important that we are having these conversations. And the same kinds of conversations that we have, whether it's e-tolls, potholes, or whatever, uh, in our industry, it's also very important to understand the markets that we want to talk to uh, and, and really what, um, what makes them tick. So what we've done is we've put together um, a, a timeline that goes by 40 years. I'm aware that the room average age is about 25, bar one or two people. <laughs> <laughs> Me and John, if you guys left, we would remain 25. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we, we looked at the last 40 years, and really what, what the, the reason we put together this timeline is to try and show um, the, the, the complexity, but yet the beauty about the self politics, the things that really um, sometimes confuse us, but things that shouldn't confuse us, those things that should make us really understand certain things. Um, so, and while I start, obviously this would be a year that you were born if you're looking at 40 year timeline. And these are some of the early images that Afropolitans would have been exposed to. I suppose this would be some of the things that some of you would have seen uh, on television, those who are um, young enough, like some people, um, would kind of see this as um, historic stuff that plays on TV. But this, this was real. This is really what was happening around that time. Huge political unrest, 
um, you know, loads of uh, uh, disturbances. This particular um, squad, those three guys that ran, I, I actually remember those guys very well. There was this special branch uh, team of guys that only came out to basically assassinate. That was their job. So these were early images uh, of, of, of uh, or early uh, sort of um, events that we were exposed to. You would know the famous picture um, of Patrick Peterson getting killed in 76. Um, but in, in all of that chaos, life was happening. Babies were born, music was happening. Um, we were still listening to music. Um, you know, we, uh, those, of, those of you who had radios in your uh, homes would be listening to squad cars. Anyone used to listen to squad cars? Yeah. These are guys who are my age now. <laughs> I've now outed myself as one of those people that need to leave the room. <laughs> um, and and those, those were the, the shows that were happening. Um, and I suppose what is also not known, and, and, and the thing about the Southpolitan as well, is that there was very little research that was done in those years for all those reasons. Um, so a whole and of middle class was missed, really, okay. Because um, somehow, because, you know, uh, because of apartheid, we were neatly packed in townships, so it was very easy to say, well, if people are in one space, they must have a similar kind of living and a similar kind of exposure. And if there's no data uh, that comes out and suggests otherwise, hey, I suppose that's what it should be and that's what it is. But the truth is, um, when you think about technology, I mean, who of you had this kind of sound system? You know, back in the day when you had to have steps. <laughs> none, of this, none of this integrated rubbish. You had to have a preamp, an amplifier. And I think in those years, this was like the early years of quadraphone. It didn't last very long, but it was kind of like an improvement to the stereophonic sound. You had to have the, you had to have the best sound. Okay. Those things weren't cheap. Okay. Um, I mean, you know, the, 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 the fact that you had to have a good turntable to listen to your music, right? So, brands that were um, creating these kinds of things, they, they didn't know that this market existed. They just created the stuff and you know, they put it out. And we just kind of had to go and find it ourselves. Now imagine if Marans back in the day ran campaigns uh, in the hood, and they had super billboards. You know, if Sony was in there in the market, you know, in the 80s, they would have been killing it. You know, today they have to, you know, contend with the Bose sound system and all these things that, by the way, we found when we went overseas. You know, uh, and yet, uh, you know, uh, these other markets would have had us uh, around this time. So. Here's what was <coughs> really interesting. So when, when I was um, around the age of 13, 14, um, we had a uh, campaign that we ran at high school. Uh, it was the Release Mandela campaign. Um, we had never seen this guy before. We didn't know what he looked like, but we knew he had to come out of jail. <laughs> and he must come as a booster. There was actually a song that we used to sing, you know? Um, uh, and it was a song to Oliver Tambo, who was in uh, exile, you know. But uh, Oliver Tambo, Tita no Porta, Akululumane, Lazarus. It's interesting how, in those years, when we sang that song, um, you know, it, it seemed impossible. You know, um, it didn't seem like this thing would happen, like Adela would be released, uh, and that he would, you know, actually come out as a Busa for real, and he did. Um, but, Life carried on. <laughs> you know? So we we still had to be ourselves. We still had to be children. So in the midst of all of that madness, um, you know, you still had to have fun. You still had to interact with life as life was happening. Um, it is very difficult for most people to understand <laughs> that we would be engaged in a release Mandela campaign and then we watch Miami Vice that evening. <laughs> um, that's if you never got arrested that day. <laughs> and if you did get arrested, does anyone from Soweto? No? Yeah. Protea? Oh, 
There we go. <laughs> you guys know about that 14 days pop and coffee story. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Because when, when as youngsters, uh, <laughs> You, you were arrested, um, you know, they wouldn't take you to uh, what was then the John Foster Square, because that was a jail for adults, but they'll take you to uh, Protea Police Station, and you'd be kept there for 14 days, no trial, and you'd be fed pop and coffee. But if you escaped that, right, you'd be at home watching Miami Vice. <laughs> okay? Uh, or listening to Radio Bob. Any Radio Bob fans? <laughs> no? If you're listening to Radio Bob, and listening to some awesome tunes. This is what was interesting about this particular market. And all of this would not have happened because we didn't have any studies that were happening at that particular time. We know these things because we were part of it. We know this because we didn't go out and research this stuff. The stuff that I'm telling you is stuff that we know, is stuff that we are. Um, so in 1994, things took a little bit of a turn. Um, obviously, so if you think about the early 90s, um, straight into the release of Mandela. This was quite an interesting time in South Africa. In fact, this period might have gone wrong for us. This was the one time things could have really, really gone wrong. If you think um, load shedding is bad, this would, have been <laughs> <laughs> this would have been a really terrible time. Um, but we depended on, you know, switched on level-headed Afropolitans who kept everyone calm. These were um, well-educated men and women who understood what the country needed at that particular time. These were not a bunch of animals who rolled out of a bush somewhere trying to take over power. These were people who understood what needed to happen. So there was a very strong sense and air of leadership. But there was also a very um, lively, middle-class life that was happening. Any Cosby Show fans in the room? <laughs> now this was the first globally accepted Afropolitan family, if you think about it. Um, but what the show did was it first showed that um, you know the Afropolitan um, is not it's not a myth. You know, um, it's it's real life. It's there. It's out there. And again. These were shows that we consumed, and these were lives that we were looking up to, and these were things that were shaping our thinking. Um, I was um, lucky to have an uncle who was uh, in and out of the States, not by choice. He was a very, very naughty photojournalist. Um, so every time the special branch looked for him, he would kind of slip out. Um, and he spent a lot of his time in New York, and he would send me tapes of a a uh, station called WPLS in New York, which played a lot of the type of music that we listen to at home. Uh, along with that, he would send um, GQ magazine, uh, which I enjoyed. I didn't have cash to buy any of the stuff. Um, but you know, I got to I got to see what the world looked like. Right? I got to cross the street and see what's on the other side. But guess what? I shared that music with my friends in my hood in DK. I shared those magazines with a lot of my friends. So we had a vision. Um, you know, we could see something. We locked onto that vision. Um, and again, that's what a lot of marketers missed. They missed the fact that was, you know, as I know we're recording the sensitive people in the room, but I have to say it this way. As much as we're in fucked up conditions, <laughs> right? When, you know, it's, 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 it's so important when, when, when you're talking, and I'm talking here specifically to young people, when you, when you, when you get them to lock onto a vision, into something that they hang on to, something that, that drives them, um, they don't care that they're hungry, they don't care that they're on a school shoes, it's not all of that stuff, but they've got this thing that they locked onto. Uh, and that's what I found, you know, with at least in, in the space that I was in. Uh, and I wasn't special or unique, there were many other people. Uh, you know, who had a similar kind of life and similar kinds of exposure. Um, and around 1997, we started to think about certain things. So around this time, again, if you were born in 73, um, most people, and there could be a 10-year gap, by the way, guys, please. Uh, but, you know, people were starting to have their first kids, first children. Uh, so your, your mindset starts to shift. You start to think about other things that are important to you. Um, you know, you're thinking about education, you're thinking about banking, you're thinking about insurance. 
But guess what? None of those guys I've been talking to since the 80s. They don't even know that you know. Okay. Um, so, I mean, does anybody remember bands like False Cars? Yeah. <laughs> Pam Bang. Um, what were the others? Neil, tell me. Um, United, some, all of those guys. Okay. Um, no, none of them, none of them were talking to the output. I don't even think they knew who were there. Okay. Um, and and to, to show that there's always been, um, to put it bluntly, money in this market. Um, in, in the early 90s, when black kids could go to what was previously white schools, you didn't see four kids out of uh, you know, the whole Soviet or the East Red, uh, or other parts of the country. But no, there were combis, right? those things were lining up. <laughs> those kids were in there, you know? Um, but these schools were not free. They had to pay money for the schools. In fact, these schools were very expensive. I mean, I went to um, um, you know, township schools all my life. People don't believe that, by the way. I don't know why. <laughs> um, but the first time I saw white people in the class was actually a triple A school of other time. <laughs> and I had this like act cool thing. <laughs> Got this. <laughs> Meanwhile, I was like, can I touch your hair? <laughs> uh, but none of these guys, none of these guys were talking. You know? um, I mean, for for the blacks in the room, um, how did you choose your bank? Let me tell you how you chose your bank. Let me tell you. First job. Okay. So you went and the HR took all your details and they said to you, have you got a bank account? <laughs> and three of you might say, yeah, because you had that Bob T thing and switched on the other thing. Sorted you out with the Bob T card. <laughs> but generally it was no. Okay? And they'll say, oh, but you need a check account. Because that's what you're going to pay yourself. Because you thought, you, like your father, you're going to go to some window. <laughs> <laughs> and they give you a brown as well. No, no, no. You are first generation success. You have to wire your money. <laughs> anyway. um, and, then, and then they said, you have to have a check account. You're like, oh, okay. Uh, so, and, and then someone at HR would always say, look, we bank with that bank. <laughs> okay? So, when you pay salaries, if you are with NetBank, you get your salary that day. <laughs> if you are with Standard Bank or FNB, you get your salary in two days. <laughs> Who wants to wait two days? <laughs> Never. Watching your colleagues with like a spring in their step on pay day, and you there thinking for eight hours. <laughs> <laughs> it's not gonna happen. <clears throat> What's the insight in this story? The insight is. Um, the bank did not talk to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, it was by default, <coughs> right? So, how do they talk to you now? It becomes very difficult, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but there's ways, and this is this is why we're here. Um, 2010 came. In fact, I must tell you, this was the one time I heard more people talk about travel, because when when uh, when we had the World Cup. Um, most people didn't didn't uh, didn't know what to expect. Yeah? So we hear this war war is coming. And you know the the <laughs> the messed up thing about you know growing up in apartheid was that at some point you thought of yourself as inferior. Yeah? So mm -hmm. so you really think very you know you don't think highly of yourself. It takes a lot to actually rise above just that condition. So when people talk about people from overseas. Huh? You prepare yourself. <laughs> overseas. You know, because overseas was TV. Yeah? Overseas was what you see on TV. I was very disappointed. My first trip to the States, I think. I went to Florida and I was looking for those gorgeous babies. <laughs> I was like, what happened? Because <laughs> what you see on television is not. Like, then I discovered my name. But anyway, um, 
So a lot of people have these high expectations. All oh, these people, you know, maybe they look like the work out of GQ magazine. And, you know, these must be special people. So we all waited patiently. We didn't even book tickets because of guests. You know? <laughs> well behaved. Even criminals were like, ah, it's George, you know. Chilling. We have visitors. Because you know what it's like. When you've got visitors, you behave. Yeah. That's when the condens comes out. And, <laughs> and all the fancy cutlery and cutlery and all that stuff. Um, but <laughs> we saw a bunch of people in backpacks <laughs> asking about uh, so where's the PNB? <laughs> overseas. <laughs> okay? <coughs> I think we can go overseas. <laughs> it's amazing how that experience. I, I started hearing a lot more people saying, oh, so maybe we should do this Brazil thing. By the way, there were people before that, okay, um, who were already traveling, were very quiet about it. I mean, I've, I have this bunch of friends who I love to hate. Because um, they always, every year they say to me, so are we doing Monaco? <laughs> and I'm like, hey man, you know Kaya, hey dog, I've got like board meetings. <laughs> when is it? But when every year when you've got a story. So you've got pockets of people who've been living it and they quite show up really happy. Uh, but the point is, um, you know, from a from a marketing point of view, we don't know how to do And you know, for us as an industry it's bad. It's bad when people are are behaving and consuming products, and we have no idea how they do it. You know? Otherwise, if we want them for our brands, how are we? I'm sorry, did I just do that to you? Press the wrong You feel like you had a sniper. <laughs> um, and a lot of these things, you know, uh, when, when you think about how people's lives have changed and the brands that they've picked uh, and why they chose those particular brands. And, and some of the advertising, and there is some great advertising, by the way, uh, and, and really great uh, communication attempts that speak to the alpha products, and some people get it. The one quick example that I want to use with insurance um, is so when, again, in, in, in my, and I, I, I refer to myself, and I'm sorry, but I know that I speak for a lot of people um, when, when I say some of these things. But, for, for a lot of us uh, growing up, insurance um, was that guy that came to your house on a Saturday morning, dust the shoes, briefcase, tie. So if he arrived early, if you're in the first house, he still looks neat. <laughs> but if he arrived like around one o'clock, the guy's been walking. Okay. Shoes are dusty, and he's there. And he's there to see your father, not your mother. He's not going to ask for your mother. He's looking for your father, and he is selling uh, a life insurance policy. Um, and this life insurance policy costs about 30 rand in those days. So it's pay 30 bucks, uh, don't skip. The insurance people are very good at that. They like banks, don't skip. You skip, this thing is null and void, it doesn't work. For you. So you can't skip. Um, and um, when you die, your wife will have 10,000 rand, and your kids will go to school and finish school. Varsity, 10,000, varsity, everything. And you will live happily in the I mean, your wife will live happily after. I mean, you are, you are, you are, you are gone happily ever after yourself. Um, and, and, and people valued that. You, because it, it, it wasn't that you valued insurance, you valued your family. So you stayed true to that thing. It, it was almost kind of like a sale of fear, you know, think about it. You know, it's kind of like, no, and this is back in the days of uh, hunter gatherer. So man is a hunter, woman is a gatherer. This career woman thing is very new to us guys, so we so easy. Um, it was it was in those years, and um, and and that was insurance. That's that's what we understood insurance was. And then and then it was quiet for thirty years. Dead quiet. If you offer quality in the room and you want to tell me that you understood. Someone the insurance talking to you, please raise your hand because I'd love to know where they were talking to. Because they weren't. It was quiet, dead quiet. 30 years, dead quiet. Until one day, um, I've got a job, but, and 
and you know we always dream about going to the suburbs because that, that's a sign of success to get out of the hood, right? I wish I didn't. I'd be a rich guy right now. But anyway, um, so you know, you get out the hood and you start. You get a house and you get property and you know you get assets. Uh, and then some fool goes over your fence and they steal your stuff. Now three things piss you off, okay, especially for a black guy. Three things piss you off. One, some idiot invaded your space. I suppose it's the same for everybody. You know, invasion is, is just, you, you hate it. You can't, this is, you are in my space. Okay? So we all hate that. Second, they took your stuff. <laughs> this is your stuff, you know, this is, and they take, like, I mean, they rip the sound system off the wall, they listen, they clean me up. Um, but the third thing is, if I was in DK, in four hours, I would know who, where, <laughs> at 6 p.m. that day, they would be putting it back and stuff, <laughs> crying, so <laughs> <laughs> you know? um, but then, someone says, and it's always a woman, <laughs> guys, <laughs> were you insured? <laughs> Why is that insurance? Oh, I remember. I stay with you. You didn't say anything when I was buying this thing. This girl's a spot um, And you say no. And, and you start again, and you get your stuff, and, you know, uh, which I did, by the way. And, and then you insure. And I think, okay, sort of. Um, and <laughs> Joseph being Joseph, they stole my stuff. <laughs> okay. uh, they did, true story, true story. You can check police records, they never missed anything. Um, <laughs> and and I, was, I, was, I was half upset this time, you know, because hey, I'm insured. Right? So I was like, okay, no, I'm insured. One of the items that was stolen um, was a leather jacket which I saved loads of money. But I think I just skipped by the son's school fees that duck you. <laughs> I bought this really, really cool leather jacket. Um, and when they stole it, they took it, they took watches and they put watches in their pockets and you know, took the micro oven and you know, part with meat and they took that. <laughs> Along with the TV. I don't know how you eat TV and watch. I don't know how you do it, but anyway, they took all that stuff. And the insurance guy comes around and he walks. How they walk, those assessors. Tick. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that gotta go to work. Let's get this done. And uh, he says, there's a problem. I'm like, what's the problem? And he says to me, um, it seems you acquired more assets after you insured, your initial insurance. I'm like, okay, so I'm claiming for the ones game. <laughs> Forget these ones. Let's talk about these ones. This is not, that's not how it works. I'm like, what do you mean that's not how it works? Cut a long story short, they replaced the TV and they gave me 800 bucks voucher to go get a leather check. <laughs> I'm like, it's cool, keep the voucher. I'll take the TV. That's going to make me feel a little better. But I, I, I had a, another bad experience. And again, dead quiet, okay? insurance-wise. Until one time I'm driving to work, and I'm listening um, to, to Kai, and I hear uh, this ad, we've got this client that bought um, space. And I'm, just, I'm thinking, you know what, let me just call and just see um, what the experience is like. Let me just see. So I pick up the call, and I phone this guy, uh, find this very happy guy, because I'm not sure if they can cold call the other way. <laughs> <laughs> so I phone, I'm like, hey, you know, um, I was listening to Kai, and I heard this commercial, and he says, oh, okay, cool. Uh, so the whole point of this is that he needs to obviously, um, the, the insurance industry has, you know, they have moved, okay? Uh, it's now paperless, it's now under 10 minutes or whatever the pitch is, you know, it's all that stuff, okay. And, and this guy needs to get a profile, okay, so he can get a quote and, you know, so he can, you know, basically get, get this whole process done. But now to get a profile, uh, he needs my name, he needs my ID number, he needs where I live, he needs 
the list of assets that I have, what they are worth, my street address. I was like, whoa, where are we going with this? We've never met. <laughs> I don't know this guy. Okay? And already I've given half my life to this person. And at that point, trust me, I said to him, hey, uh, you know what, I'm driving and there's police. <laughs> and it was half true. I was driving, but I was on hands free. But the thing is, I got very uncomfortable. Um, <coughs> giving away all that information. Now, it doesn't mean that a person like myself does not understand um, you know, innovation. What it means is if that particular insurance company understood um, certain insights and said to their people, look, when you get a customer who fits this particular profile in Apple politics, you need to switch your questions. Mm. Okay? And how you switch your questions is Say to them, first, I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions, and if at any point you're uncomfortable with the information that I need, then I can manage them. What does that mean? That means 30 years ago, when that guy came to my father's house, what he did was establish trust. He shook his hand, he gave him business cards, he looked in his eyes. That's what I saw. 30 years on, I'm with a guy on the phone who I'm trying to imagine what they look like. And already they know everything about me, and I don't know anything about them. And from an advertising point of view, someone will sit back and say, well, we put these spots on Kaya and they don't work because mm. our conversion is not right. Yeah. Whereas it's in the communication. It's not just about you know, getting people's attention. But it's also about knowing what you need to say to them, where you need to switch your questions, where you need to say um, this group of people understand um, you know, my products different. We talk about the Afropolitan having been there for a very long time. This house, can you guess where this is? It's the Cliff Extension. Um, this house has been standing for 30 years, or somewhere around between 25 and 30 um, well, The car is still new. Um, and, and, the, and the point of, of, of showing um, this particular house is that if this was 25 years ago um, and already 25 years before this there was in fact much longer uh, in places like Rockville, Pinkville, um, which had much bigger houses by the way back in the day um, you already had you know uh, a lot of um, you know kind of middle class living happening in the hood it's been there for a very long time and that's the whole point. The whole point is that it's not new because like we consume Miami Vice, we consume suits. And it's, it's a behavior thing. It's what we're talking to. Middle we'll class about behavior more than it is about money. Yes, it is about money. You've got to be able to afford these things that you, that you look at and consume. But it is important to understand. So when you look at it in full, um, you know, it starts off at that point with a lot of these things that uh, you know, that, that seem, that, that, that profile you different. Somehow, you put together like, you know, uh, tiny little home and tiny little radio and political unrest and money being too tight to mention. Because the romantic story, I mean, let's face it, is uh, if, if I stood here and I said to you, um, I grew up in a village somewhere and I had no shoes and, um, Walking to school was far, and you know, but I worked hard and I locked onto that dream. That's a romantic story, it's not. Mm. And it's a true story for a lot of people. But it's also true that a lot more people had cheese in their brains. We didn't call them cheese balls for nothing. Um, it's also true that you know a lot of people uh, you know consume CNN when they start. It's also true that the effects of it's it's ironic how some of these things that were meant to keep us apart kind of created certain um, advantages, if you like, you know, in, 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 in our lives. So when you think broadly about Afropolitics, um, it is very important to remember that that gap, okay, that kind of, um, sorry, let me go back to one second, that space between the, the 70s Okay, how are you? So 
that, you know, if you think about that, that entire space there, up until 1997, I would guess, um, where there wasn't any real authentic, any kind of substantial uh, communication towards politics, and yet those were the years of our making. Yeah? It's now very important to understand how you do it at that point. Now, it's not, again, like I said, rocket science. It's really about engagement. It's really about having a conversation about um, you know, where people's minds are. Um, and how you just really tweak some of the things that you say. And I suppose the friends that you have. Thank you.